Good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this logistics webinar on the ocean market predictions for 2022. My name is Andrew Schultz. I'm Global Head of Ocean and Trucking here at Flexport, and I'm very, very excited to spend the next full hour with, uh, with all of you. Before we get into the content and introduce the, the speakers, uh, a few practical uh, remarks out there on how to navigate the app right here in front of you. In the top uh, right corner, you see a few features. Uh, one of them is the Q&A feature, where you're more than welcome to ask any question that's on top of mind. Uh, that question will be funneled to uh, any of the Flexport uh, experts available that will answer the question directly to you so it won't go out in the, in the public. We also have an opportunity for you to download the slide deck right here if you want to share it with any colleagues, friends or families for that matter. Um, and there is also a recording on the, uh, on the presentation, um, which you can also download uh, right after. Um, a big fat disclaimer uh, before we go into, uh, in, into the content, as, as always. What uh, Bjorn, Lars and myself will talk about today is, uh, is an ever-changing ocean landscape out there. So uh, even after this webinar, what we have conveyed, you know, we may have a new disruption out there. We may have a new event. So take uh, whatever content we present today for what it is. We also want to make sure that we lean out, predict, uh, but uh, it is pretty hard to predict in, the, in this environment. So uh, take it for, for what it is. Um, super happy to, um, to, to present the, 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 the two panelists today, Lars and, uh, and Bjorn. First, uh, a big warm welcome to you, Lars, uh, dialing in from Copenhagen. Thanks a lot. Glad to be here. Lars is uh, CEO uh, of uh, Vespucci Maritime uh, and a long-term veteran in the, in the shipping and logistics industry. Lars, Lars has been advising uh, the one company after the other uh, year in, year out. So very excited to, uh, to pick your brain uh, today, Lars. Then we have uh, Bjorn van Jensen uh, joining us from, uh, from Dubai today. Uh, welcome to you, Bjorn. Thank you very much, Anas. Delighted to be here. Bjorn used to uh, run uh, the global logistics practice for Electrolux, a massive import uh, globally, a massive importer of goods uh, globally uh, for, for many, many years. And then last year, Bjorn uh, joined uh, Sea Intelligence. So again, very excited to pick your brain today, uh, Bjorn. Let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, first off, uh, I think we're all acutely aware that the world of logistics, the world of uh, global supply chains is pretty, pretty complex in of itself. So we have chosen to keep the agenda very, very simple. Um, first off, we'll dig into uh, the current ocean markets. What are the latest and greatest in terms of facts and stats? Uh, what are we seeing out there? Then we'll move into what's ahead. What do we see uh, upcoming on the horizon? And uh, what are some of our predictions? And then lastly, and most importantly, we'll uh, dig into recommendations. Uh, we have uh, two of the most renowned experts uh, on stage here, Lars and Bjorn. would love to pick their brain on like recommendations, both tactically and strategically, as to how to navigate uh, this year and the years to come in the world of, uh, in the world of ocean freight. Let's, uh, let's start with um, acquiring statistics on, the, on ocean schedule reliability, uh, which has yet again hit record lows at 32%. And um, the last time, Lars, you and I spoke, uh, I think we both uh, had some expectation that uh, we would see, you know, the red graph slightly uh, move uh, up and to the right in a, in a rather low pace, but it's actually only gone worse. At least uh, I had predicted it to improve uh, towards the 40% uh, level or so. But the reality is global schedule reliability is 32% at the moment. On Asia to West Coast, uh, nine out of 10 vessels uh, are arriving late. Only one out of 10 is arriving on time. Bjorn, how do you see this and how does this break down to each of the different trade lanes out there? And how do you predict this uh, going forward? It's shocking. It's, uh, it's almost uh, making a joke of the very phrase liner trade. If you, deter, if, you, if you define liner trade as a vessel that arrive, uh, departs a certain point, uh, on schedule and arrives more or less on schedule. It, it's 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 shocking. And and what's really shocking is this thirty two percent curve, which <clears throat> has shown virtually nothing but decline for over a year now. It masks a, an even worse reality when you dive into it on a on a trade and sub trade basis. So the thirty two percent global average, if you narrow that down to the to the U.S. West Coast, let me just consult my notes. We're at twenty percent 
if you look at the uh, sorry uh, east coast is is 20% west coast is 10% if you take that to europe where congestion is going crazy right now you've got fairly similar numbers about 20% on the northwest continent 18% accuracy uh, on the mediterranean trades from asia and and i see no signs of recovery because a lot of this has to do with what we're going to be talking about the gummed up supply chain in the us that just cascades into the rest of the world and is now really gathering pace in Europe. So I, I, I don't see anything that could uh, that could in the short term uh, uh, bring these numbers up in any meaningful way. To just put a slightly happy spin on the numbers, the one place in the world where things have stayed fairly normal is Africa. They used to be the <laughs> bottom of reliability. Now they're more or less at the top of reliability. Be, be, because a lot of vessels have been pulled out of that trade so they could be deployed on the U.S. West Coast. So there's fewer vessels for the same port. So, yeah. Interesting. Uh, okay, so in, in short, no <laughs> signs of improvement in, in the very near term on, on this. On the uh, I can see. On the I can see. Let's take a look at the, the total transit time because I think one thing is, you know, the, the vessel schedule uh, reliability. It's tough to, to be on time when queues are longer than, than never seen before, right? Uh, if we take a look at the, the total transit time from, from the very end to end, um, this is the Flexport Ocean Timeliness Indicator where we basically measure total transit time from the time the cargo is ready at the factory until it has left the destination port. So in other words, the very full end-to-end -end transit times. The TLDR here is that uh, the transit times have uh, more than double uh, in some cases. Uh, the relative improvement between Trans-Pacific and Asia Europe is that Trans-Pacific have actually exceeded Asia Europe uh, in, in terms of total transit time, despite the fact that the, the, the actual routing is, uh, is shorter. Now, Lars, we are at an interesting point in time, uh, the week before Chinese New Year, where a lot of factories will, uh, will shut down. Do you expect uh, this um, graph to take uh, to take a drop because of Chinese New Year, or how do you see the coming weeks and months? Not, not in the short term, not at all. It, it reflects pretty well the problem is not the vessels. The problem is actually not the ports either. The problem is inland. And in terms of Chinese New Year, in the most happy of circumstances, you would see the normal seasonal slump, which likely you won't, but that would be the happy one. But that would still mean that that would mean exports would stop out of China in the beginning of February. So this would only impact your stats a month, month and a half down the line. So in all likelihood, this will continue to get worse for a couple of months. Then it will begin to taper off. And that is assuming we get no curveballs. And in all likelihood, we very much will get more curveballs, starting with high likelihood of shutdowns of ports and terminals in China. Mm. It could get even worse. Uh, I mean, let's just let's just understand also in the context of is there any capacity to be added to the market? Is is no. But not only that, this congestion in and of itself is reducing available to you capacity in the market by an astonishing number. I think it's ten, twelve, some say fourteen percent, which is roughly the equivalent of the entire fleet of CMA, CGM, or Costco disappearing solely as a consequence of, of, of capacity being soaked up by congestion. Those vessels are lying off of Long Beach or, or every, everywhere waiting to get in, right? So I, I, I totally would last. And then add to that that on the West Coast now, uh, uh, the last I saw today in the Wall Street Journal was 1,700 dock workers in LA. Long Beach alone uh, uh, have been infected with, uh, with COVID, which again, according to the WSJ, is is the largest is larger than the cumulative number that were infected in 2021. So there's not even just a Chinese infection problem. This is the gift that keeps on giving. And just, just to broaden it out, I know, and I'm guilty of it as well. We often end up <coughs> talking about Los Angeles Long Beach because it's just yeah. so visible. It's almost the canary mm -hmm. in the coal mine. But you see, yeah. the port of Rotterdam have something like 15 percent of their staff out with COVID. So there are multiple gangs of workers that can't be there. Antwerp has been up to 40 to 50 percent for a while. That was off because of COVID restrictions. So this is very much a global phenomenon. Yeah. 
Interesting. So basically what you're saying is that you don't expect um, uh, any relief in, in the next couple of months and you would expect uh, additional curveballs to hit, which in other words means that we should expect these elevated levels for, uh, for quite some time. Yes, yeah, and right. if anything, that happy slump that Lars mentions, we all know those who have been around for a long time, it just means that that's going to be followed by an unhappy wave of pent-up uh, uh, shipments from China. So, no. Okay. Let's, um, let's take a look at the next, uh, the next one. Lars, you briefly touched on this, um, namely um, the port of uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach <coughs> is indeed the world's most congested port at the moment. Uh, we're seeing uh, more than 100 uh, vessels waiting uh, consistently for, for months now. The average waiting time uh, per vessel is more than 18 days. So it takes more than 18 days uh, upon arrival to actually be able to offload uh, your cargo. Uh, that's doing better relative, uh, I- relatively in other ports where we see you know, the average uh, waiting line of, of 12 vessels and, and four days. But uh, to your point, Lars, it is climbing uh, by the day in other ports as well. If we take a look at the math we've outlined right here on the, on the port of uh, Los Angeles and, 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 and Long Beach, um, this basically translates into five weeks worth of backlog, which is, which is all time high. Um, Bjorn, should we expect this uh, backlog to continue? It sounds like it based on what you just mentioned, but uh, any, any relief, any, any silver bullets uh, you can reveal here? This is rapidly turning into the Dr. Doom show, right? Because, because there, I don't see any relief here uh, either because th- this number, the 108 vessels, that goes up and down. It's, it, it, it's, sometimes it's 97, sometimes it's 123. It makes for great headlines. Uh, but but what the real problem is in the port, right? Uh, uh, and the interland uh, activities. Can you get it out of the port? Can you get down on 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 chassis in the first place? Can you land it because the ports are gummed up with empty boxes now for export? Uh, can you get it out of the gate? Uh, can you get it on to a rail ramp or to a rail ramp? Can you get it on a truck? And the answer to all of them is well, you can, but it takes an awful lot of time. This number is not going anywhere within that band of 98, 9 to 120, 130 anytime soon. And certainly not until we solve the hinterland problems. And Lars can wax poetically about that for a long time. (laughs) No, what what I want to do is add a different element that's usually forgotten when we talk about these. uh, you, You mentioned it beyond the headline grabbing numbers. If the reality was only, okay, fine, vessels are 18 days late, and at least I could plan for that. But that's not the reality. Yeah. I mean, there is a, a, a smaller container carrier headquartered here in Copenhagen that if you look at their latest customer advisory, they were saying, well, the delay of our vessels is somewhere between mm-hmm. zero and 28 days. So it's not just that the average number is high. It is phenomenally unpredictable uh, on mm-hmm. top of it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. Make up for all I'll, that inventory I'll, 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 are depleted. I'll try and tee up the two the two gentlemen as we uh, as we go through the hour here to get out of the 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 the, the Doctor Doom show. Uh, but we we'd also rather you know set set clear expectations instead of over over promising and uh, and and uh, and under delivering. Uh, but um, there are there are a few glimpses of sunlight later on in uh, in, in, in in the presentation. Uh, let's uh, let's see what that looks like later. Um. Zooming in on, on what's causing a lot of this, um, as Lars and Bjorn alluded to uh, briefly, is, is, is indeed the land side uh, congestion, right? Um, because if you just inject more vessel capacity into the system and land side uh, congestions remains, you're not really uh, helping the situation. In many cases, you're doing matters worse, right? And we see some you know, eye-popping stats right here on the left side in terms of... Um, dwell time in the terminal and outside of the, the, the terminal because of uh, shortage on truck drivers, chassis, warehousing capacity. Um, and then on the right side, uh, we've done a, a projection in, in terms of uh, U.S. Um, truck driver uh, capacity and, and shortage of the same. It's a well-known fact that um, we've already seen uh, trucking driver shortage uh, for years now. But um, looking into the future, it's actually expected uh, to get uh, to get worse, um, which is which is not uh, not not a great uh, piece of news. 
Last, Bjorn, any, um, anything that could save the day here? It's a, it's a long projection uh, going into 2030. Automatic trucks, is that something that could uh, shave uh, some of the bars here or any, any other silver bullets? No, no, I think you need to look in another direction. I mean, uh, automated trucks, that's a pipe dream, at least in the short to medium term. That's, that's not really going to happen apart from grabbing a few headlines. But there's another thing afoot here. This truck driver shortage, uh, just to make a ridiculous example, assume as of tomorrow you're going to pay the truck drivers half a million dollars per year. I guarantee you, you won't have a truck driver shortage. Part of the resolution in this is everybody has to get used to the fact that the supply chain is going to be more expensive than we've been used to, both on the vessels, but also on the land side. And that's what's actually going to solve the truck driver shortage. It's supply and demand. Yeah. There, there's, there's a human factor as well there, which I think is interesting. I've spent quite a lot of time in my previous uh, uh, job uh, working very closely with truckers at the personal level in the in the San Pedro Bay area, and and there is it's something as simple as boredom and lack of job satisfaction that is keeping people from joining, especially the 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 short distance haulage, so the pickup of a chassis with a with a with a full and delivering it to a warehouse somewhere in the near in the near area, even if they're paid for it. The drivers simply don't, nobody wants a job that requires them to sit for 12 hours in a queue uh, trying to, to, to get into a gate and half the time being turned away because there was something wrong with the booking system or they were meant to go into a different gate or they're interacting with the wrong union guy who hates truckers and vice versa. Nobody wants the job. They'd rather drive Uber or Lyft or drive for, for the local uh, Walmart, Target, uh, whatever home delivery service, because it gives them satisfaction. I think it's very important. It's not necessarily just about the money, although I agree with Lars. I'd go drive a truck for half a million dollars a year. Uh, but but there's a lot of... The lifestyle is going away. There's a younger crowd that we're trying to bring into this, uh, to this uh, uh, function, and they don't want to join. Uh, is that going to get fixed? No. Are we going to fix it with automatic truck? No, because they still require, you guessed it, an in-cab driver. He may have his hands off the wheel, but it's still got to be there. This is, this is, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. 2030? Uh-uh. Uh, so it's about how do we, how do we somehow make it fun to be a trucker again? And it is not fun. But never forget the human element here. It's very powerful. What, what would you do, Bjorn, or Lars, if you had a magic hand here and that you could get all parties, you know, on the same page, uh, solutioning, you know, uh, authorities, uh, associations, private companies, what would, uh, what would you do if you could dictate the whole, the whole thing in a positive way? You have to find a system that incentivized every single player to play ball, and they are not. Uh, you, you've got the added complication. I hope not too many of them listening, but some of them probably are, and, and there's no disputing it. I've seen it with my own eyes. You cannot get away from the fact that there are huge dichotomies and, and, and arguments that take place between the various players. The rail people hate the trucking people. The truck drivers hate the unions. The, union hates, the unions hate the terminal operators. The terminal operators hate everybody. Uh, you've got to somehow incentivize everybody either through rewards or penalties to work together and create a unified system. But again, is that going to happen in six months? No, it's not. It, it, it can it happen. Yes, it, it can theoretically happen, but there is so much pent up and, and historical animosity between the various cogs in that machine that it's very, very complicated. And, 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 and we see it now. It's kind of worked for forever. But in a crisis like this, it, all those icebergs, as I call them, you know, are, are all of a sudden uh, uh, laid bare, right? The icebergs that, that are made up of the animosities between the players. Yeah, I, I, would, I would more turn it around and say, again, that, and that's also not going to be a silver bullet short term, but the no. key to this is data and information. You have to have full access to all information across all stakeholders. Move the competition away from who is better at keeping their information hidden to who is yeah. better able to use the data. Because right now, all anybody can do is to sub-optimize their own position. 
which looks great on their own KPIs, mm -hmm. but is overall detrimental. In a normal market, that kind of works because you've got buffer capacities throughout the system to pick up all the different spikes you see. But over the last 18 months, there has been precisely <coughs> zero buffer capacity anywhere. So the normal yeah. small snacks become major problems because we can't solve them. So that's what you're saying is almost making it mandatory uh, to share uh, data publicly uh, so, so everyone can collaborate around same. Yeah, yeah e exactly. And you have to go down a path where, and I know I mean, we have this phrasing that data is the new oil. Unfortunately, it seems a lot of people are misinterpreting and say, well, if my data is oil, I'm not going to give it to anybody unless they pay me a fortune. And, that, and that's a complete misunderstanding because then there is no value to anyone. It's a matter of yeah. sharing all that data. The data is the new oil for those who are then very good at using the data. That's what you need to compete on. If I can just, just add, it's not enough to just look at the players here. The, the, there's one player we're, we're missing here in this, right? We're talking about the truck drivers and the unions and the terminal operators and the, and the, the railroads and whatnot. We're not talking about the importers and their behavior. And I was one of them once. Right, I know all the games that importers play. I've played uh, more than a few of them myself, and probably many people on on, on this uh, uh, webcast have, have played. Or women I have, have played uh, those games. Right, there is a, a a mentality change and education that needs to play, take place, and an incentivization slash penalization process that needs to be implemented there to force importers to play ball because otherwise it's it's all for nothing. You, you if those containers are still sitting on chassis in people's yards, being used as warehouses on wheels, well, then everything we do at the, on the port side is for nothing. At, at the end of the day, the ultimate, and I know that's a <laughs> wet dream for anybody with a data lake, right? But that would be start this at the point where a purchase order is being placed by the importer. Because once yeah. that order is being placed at, say, the stuffed kangaroo factory in Alice Springs, then I can already predict what's the trucking requirement going to be in Australia, what's the feeder, what's the deep sea, what's the ports, what's the yeah. destination, all the way across. And if you can collate that for all the different stakeholders, you can predict bottlenecks, which also means to some degree you can avert the bottlenecks. But it requires data at that level. Yeah, yeah completely, completely agree here. Okay, let's... Um... Let's move on and take a look at um, at another sort of glaring uh, statistics right here. Uh, the number of of blanked or skipped sailings um, into into the west coast. Um, I think the irony here is that there is more demand than supply. We need more supply or more capacity. Yet we are seeing a record high uh, number of blankings or skipped sailings, uh, which is you know a necessity because of these long queues and all this congestion. It doesn't make sense to just you know keep uh, stacking up the, the queues here, right? On the left side, um, some interesting stats on, um, on the Trent-Pacific eastbound volumes as a whole. Um, we are seeing that uh, at the moment, um, around 52% uh, of, of volume is, is going into the, the West Coast. It actually uh, used to be as high as, as 60%. So we are seeing an impact where some of the cargo is being diverted to other ports, including East Coast, etc., because of the West Coast congestion. Same for Los, Los Angeles. Uh, right now, um, it, it, it's around 40% of the Trans-Pacific volume going into the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, that number actually used to be higher, but it's been taken down because of these, um, these, these congestions that remains higher there on a relative uh, scale. Bjorn, um, any any additional insights here? Uh, it is tough, you know, for importers and shippers to understand. Like, okay, we're short of capacity. Uh, we have more demand than we're able to ship. Yet we're seeing all these blanking. So, please help us uh, tom this down and and uh, make sure everybody is is on the same page here and what's going so, on. Some, some of it is undoubtedly COVID driven at the at the origin uh, site. I mean, if if there's no dock workers to 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 serve that ship uh, or no, no gangs for the vessel, then why have a sailing? There's potentially no sailing. Uh, some of it is diversion to other ports, but it's difficult to see what other ports can really absorb much more volumes. I, I would tend to think that it's more a combination of COVID at origin, uh, a, a lack of desire to have your vessels join the queue, 
uh, and and potentially some some alternative ports, but there aren't that many alternative ports available. Vancouver used to be the dirty little secret, uh, that magic wand uh, for those who knew about it, Houston. But none of these ports has the capacity to take up the slack from an LA Long Beach, and that's why we are always talking about LA Long Beach. Uh, yes, SeaTac is there, Vancouver is there, Oakland is there. They've had their own problems as well, oscillating back and forth between congestion and, and being clear. You can't predict it. What do you think, Lars? Yeah, that, there's a couple of other elements to keep in mind. You mentioned it yourself earlier, Bjorn, that this is less liner shipping and more like trap yeah. shipping because yeah. on one hand, we have this rapid escalation in blank sailings. At the same time, we have more capacity deployed than ever before. So you could also yeah. draw a map of saying, what are all the extra loaders? It would look the same. Mm. So it's the regularity here that's going out the window. Yeah. And if you look at the, the graph here, you see Chinese New Year 2019, tri- Chinese New Year 2020, the usual spikes. That's mm. a choice on the carrier because demand drops. But what yeah. we're seeing now is not so much a choice from the carrier. It's out of necessity. When my ship has been caught in that queue for three weeks, obviously it didn't make it back to China. So right. I have no choice but to bank the sailing. I physically don't have the ship. It's a different driving mechanism what i might be able to do which some of them do is i'll charter a small vessel at a quarter million dollars a day and put that in as an extra loader only to see it go into the queue as well so the normal way of thinking about blank sailings is also becoming almost redundant in the current market environment we think we at least for the time being need to think of this more as a tramper operated uh, entity than a liner operated entity yeah yeah, yeah, it's a good point. You got to bring the vessels back on schedule if you even have them. So, this is what you do. We used to call it omissions. Now we blank the whole sailing instead, right? It's omission. Handpicked omissions are no longer enough. Yeah. On that note, um, we we tried here to sort of depict how it all hangs together, right? Um, total demand versus planned sailings or planned capacity. <laughs> And then the actual, uh, then the actual um, capacity after these planked or skipped sailings. Uh, the, 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 the TLDR here again is that um, you know carriers have indeed injected a lot of uh, a lot of uh, new capacity into the market. Uh, we see that in the purple line here, right? I think there's sometimes this false perception that uh, we're not, you know, increasing um, supply as an industry. That that's actually not true. You see that here in the purple line, it is increasing over time. Um, same with the actual uh, effective capacity available after these blanked or skipped sailings. It's also increasing relative to a year ago. Uh, the brutal fact is, of course, uh, that is still very uh, short of, of the demand out there. Um, and um, and that's that's basically the, the story we've been seeing now for, for 18 straight months. Last, yeah. there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in, in the global markets. Um, EU politics, tensions, um, inflations, hikes in interest <clears throat> rates, um, the stock market and whatnot. Could this change the game uh, in, in, in the near term uh, on, on, on the imbalance we're seeing here? How do you, how do you see it? Right now, there are not really any signs that, that that's about to happen. If you look at the U.S. economy, it's still doing fine. Sure, there's inflation coming in. One thing we need to keep in mind here with inflation is being waved around as a flag as if this is enormously bad for the economy. We need to keep in mind that deflation has only been here a few years. Inflation was the normal state of affairs. Sure, right now it's slightly higher than what we used to be. A lot of that is not even supply chain driven. That is unlikely to get a major change to the demand spree. On top of that, we're seeing increasing demand in Europe because keep in mind this phenomenal boom in demand was up until recently purely a U.S. phenomenon. Now we're beginning to see the European consumers become slightly stronger as well, which is just going to add to the pressure for capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so no no relief. no, and, and maybe just one more comment on inflation, because, uh, again, we're back to if, if you read the headlines, there's been no end to this. Oh, my God, we're hitting into the 1970s kind of horrible scenario. 
if you start to look at the numbers, the more reasonable comparison that has been pulled up is this actually looks more like what you saw in the uh, post-World War II boom or in the boom that came after the Korean War. So after you had a downturn, then fine, you have a surge and you have a boost to inflation. It looks more like that than it looks like the 1970s. Yeah. Interesting. That's good perspective. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at how this uh, translates into to rates or prices out there. No surprise, everyone is acutely aware of the, of the inflated rate levels uh, relative to to the pre pandemic environment. When you look at the the the, the, the rate indices in, in aggregate, uh, we're talking about a four x increase um, ever since um, ever since mid twenty twenty. Um, but that's the rate indices. That's not necessarily the effective moving rates, taking you know equipment and loading priority into consideration. If we if we take a look at at, at the prices from that perspective, we're rather talking about a five x increase uh, since um, mm -hmm. in 2020, um, and that's on the spot market. Um, every time you know you make a booking and and you get capacity uh, for for same as a one off uh, spot shipment, so to speak. If we take a look at the fixed um, prices uh, typically uh, signed up uh, on an annual basis on the Trans-Pacific, for example, um, it's looking like the price uh, levels that will come in in this contract season um, for 2022 relative to 2021 will land somewhere around 3x um, the fixed prices uh, that were signed in 2021. Now, Bjorn, if, if you had the opportunity to uh, to sign up for some of those uh, fixed prices, uh, is that something you would go for? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty here, and three x is uh, is quite staggering, right? How do you how do you see it? Depends it depends on your volume, and it depends on whether that's a static three x throughout whatever the duration of that contract is. Because what we're also seeing is is a is a shift. I mean, I've always in, in my previous role, we always signed. Uh, one-year contracts and in fact sometimes also uh, uh, a few occasions longer index regulated contracts are some of the first to try and do it um i would sign up but i wouldn't sign blank you know 3x for the next three years and that's not what i'm hearing is being offered in the market either carriers are very keen for sure on 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 long-term contracts and three years seems to be the, the, the duration they're all converging on, whether then diverge again is are these what we call tiered rates. So, OK, I'll give you, you know, uh, uh, 8,000 to the West Coast uh, in year one, uh, 7,600 in year two and, and, and 5,000 in year three fixed, maybe some floating bunker. Or are we going to index regulate the whole shebang on a maybe quarterly basis over a three year period? Uh, the latter, I would be very comfortable with signing, and indeed, I would go for it. Um, but you need uh, significant volume to be able to do that. And then the last element of it, of course, is what other demands are you facing from the carriers? Because you're seeing, even in exchange for these, uh, on the face of it, lucrative agreements, you better be a very steady importer with really good control of your data because we're looking at full debt freight, which is something that as we all know that debt freight theoretically exists. I don't know anybody who's ever paid it unless they've had a massive dispute with the carrier. I don't, I can't remember the last time I heard of anybody paying debt freight. The MQC is usually just extended now, full debt freight. Uh, if you don't meet, uh, meet um, uh, your MQC. Uh, seasonality is something carriers still don't seem to have understood. So if you promise them 5,200 to you, they expect 100 every week, no matter what, which of course is not the real world. So the devil is in the details as you sign these, if you sign these long-term contracts, very, very much in the details. But index regulated, I would go for in the blink of an eye. And I, can, I know for a fact that for large importers, the, the, the real rates that are being offered are very significantly lower than these, but you need the volume and the flexibility and the guts to sign up for full debt freight. And that's a hard sell in a lot of companies, but you can get it. That's good insight, Brian. Any, any additional thoughts from you there, Lars? 
Um, my, my thought is also down the line, and there's an added dimension everybody should keep in mind as well, is even if you are in a position to say, oh, I think 3x for full year is going to be bloody expensive. Well, keep in mind, what is the risk you're facing? The risk you're facing yeah. is if markets deteriorate even further, we might later in this come back to why they actually might. It's not only going to be a matter of spot rates are going to spike. It's going to be a matter of, for some of the carriers, if you don't have these contracts, your cargo won't move, period. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that the trade-off here is, sure, I might end up paying more than I would like, but it gives me certainty of space, yeah. which is actually yeah. not guaranteed in the next couple of months. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, so... TLDR here is that the devil is in the detail, uh, and uh, it's important to, to study any any term and condition uh, when embarking on, on anything of this nature. Yeah. Okay, let's um, let's take a look at um, the, <clears throat> the difference between uh, what we define as uh, as standard um, services relative to premium services. We seem to have lost you on us. Indeed, we did, but you and I are still here, Bjorn. So, yeah. why don't we uh, head off? He was on the uh, premium services uh, versus yeah, the yeah, normal Anas. ones. Anas, are you with us? Yeah, can you? Uh, ah, okay. okay. Yeah, you, you you blinked out. I caught out. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes. All okay, good. great. Um, essentially, um, what I was uh, what I was saying is is what we are seeing is that the difference between standard and premium services is is give or take 20 20 percent on the on the transit time from cargo ready date at origin until destination port arrival. Um, yeah. Given the fact that premium services come with uh, with equipment and loading priority, uh, which which makes it faster, it also comes at a higher cost. Um, again, the devil's in the detail by trade by port combination, um, but on average you would have to pay. Um, between say three and, and five thousand dollars more um, for premium relative to standard. The, the question uh, we, we have for the group here, we would we would love to do a quick poll is to, to see is is this worth it uh, based on your experiences? Uh, let's say the past uh, the, the the past eighteen months since the, the pandemic hit, because the premium services have also changed quite a bit relative to pre pandemic. So. We'd love to uh, learn from the group uh, how you see this. Um, let's do a quick uh, poll here. So the question we have from all of you, um, and you just select uh, one of the answers with a with, with a click of a button. Um, how often have premium services offered desired results in terms of loading priority and transit time um, advantages relative to, to 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 standard services? Every time. Most of the time, never or rare, or I've never used premium services. Uh, we would love to learn from the, the group here. We'll give you uh, 20, 20 seconds or so. All right, let's see the, the results here. It seems like um, most of the time is, is the most popular at 43%. Um, and then there's an even split between never rare or have never used premium services. Let me ask you, uh, Lars, is this a surprise? Would you have expected the, the stats to come out differently? Uh, that is a good question. I'm actually not sure how I would have expected the stats to come out. So I'm, I'm very uncharacteristically going to draw a blank on the answer to that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it. I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I am not surprised by the haven't used premium services. In fact, I, I thought I thought it might be slightly lower, given that everybody's out there hunting for any way to move cargo. That I would have expected to be much less. But what really surprises me is the never or rare. As premium services do tend to come with some level of guarantee, which means the carriers that I'm aware of that offer them uh, go out of their way to deliver that product in terms of loading and equipment. So to see almost 30% claiming that rarely or never have they gotten what they bought uh, or paid for, uh, that is that is surprising to me, very surprising. 
but I think it's also worth noting a that we don't have a time frame here. So perhaps we should have said with post pandemic or, or uh, since since the pandemic began, how often have you used them? Because premium services did exist before the pandemic, right? Uh, and also we must remember that we're asking here about loading priority and transit time. We're not really building in, okay, did the cargo also get off the ship? <laughs> and was it actually delivered on dock and, and available to clear, right? But I'm only really surprised by the bottom number. I would have thought that would be quite a lot lower. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there, Bjorn. There is definitely some uh, exploration to, 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 to be had there. Mm. Okay, let's... Um... Let's move on um, to the next topic right here. Okay, inventory levels uh, relative to um, to to, uh, to sales ratios. Um, if we look at the red line here, it's a fact that inventory uh, levels have uh, improved, but the sad story here is that they still cannot keep up with uh, with sales. So there is no real improvement on the inventory to sales ratio on the green line, as you can see right here. Uh, an important call out here is that this data typically comes with two to three month lag. Um, Lars, how would you see uh, the more recent data um, for say December or, or January for that matter? Yeah, Should we expect in the green line? Yeah, I, I wouldn't expect any uptake in the green line. And uh, there's also another element we need to, to keep in mind here when you look at the inventory levels, because when you look deep down in the methodology, it is quite unclear just how much of the inventory that's stuck on the ships off the coast mm. is yeah. and is not included. And it would appear yeah, yeah. that a sizable part is actually not included here. So the real inventory levels are likely to be somewhat higher than what the red line would seem to suggest. However, as we talked about before, demand is lie, or, or rather consumer spending seems to be holding up quite well. So this is going to continue for quite a while to come. Uh, this is really only going to change at a medium perspective into the future when we get the bottlenecks resolved. When we get the bottleneck resolved, then you're going to see a massive bullwhip effect because then all of a sudden, all the inventory stock in the ships are going to pile in and then we're going to have a different problem. But that's not in the cards uh, until likely way towards the end of this year, at the earliest. And, and on top of that, not only will we see the, the bullwhip for sure, but I, we may see a second bullwhip or an even larger bullwhip oscillation simply because a lot of importers that I interact with regularly are saying they're very seriously reviewing their inventory policies. Uh, back to your point about whether where the premium services are worth it, right? That that already in and of itself, the answer to that depends on what's, what's your cargo worth, right? And what is the value of having stuff available to sell? Yeah. Uh, uh, is that worth 5,000K more per container? I would suggest that for a lot of importers, they're rapidly coming to that realization. For years, inventory has been a four-letter word in the C-suite, right? And we don't like it. Maybe truth is that most companies are operating at a ludicrously low whack to the point where inventory levels are certainly well, should be a kpi but not a bonusable one with the focus the inventories has had now customers are coming around to saying we need to double our, when space becomes available what we're, we're going to double our inventory policies uh, relative to what what they were before we're not just going to restock to get back to our old policies we're actually going to double up uh, because this cannot happen again. There are people who, whose inventories are depleted. I mean, this, think of the automotive industry. Uh, how long does it take to get a new car in the U.S. now? 18 months from the day you order it until the day you get it, right? It's the old uh, GM saying it takes 1,200 parts to build a car. It only takes one part to not build a car. Uh, and, and we're in that territory, not just in automotive, but in a lot of... Uh, manufacturing operations right so let's not forget manufacturing on top of the retailers is very important and they will create a huge uh, bullwhip uh, addition uh, yeah, when it comes that, that's a very good point and i, think I agree with Lars. not not until they can and they can't until we 
solve the Gondorf uh, infrastructure and the ports and the interlands. Yeah, that that uh, makes a ton of sense. And I think <clears throat> we here in the interest of time, Lars, what you mentioned in terms of consumer spending and transactions, if you take that into consideration, the forecast uh, in terms of import volumes remain strong based on the transactions and purchase orders and whatnot we're seeing out there. Um, so um, that's, uh, that, that, that's definitely uh, an important fact to, to take into consideration. Let's, uh, let's pivot uh, in the interest of time to uh, another very, very important topic. Um, there is a potential strike uh, coming up uh, over the summer on the, on the West Coast. Nobody knows, uh, but there are definitely some learnings in the past uh, we can leverage and take into consideration when planning and looking into routing alternatives. Lars, help us understand the the, the potential situation here and, uh, and, 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 more, and walk us down memory lane on, on what has happened in the past year. Yeah, you, you can say basically the contract between the terminals and the Port Workers Union, the ILWU, expires by June uh, of this year. And if we look back in the past, uh, there's been two cases where they failed to reach an agreement. One time was in 2002. That led to the complete shutdown of all U.S. West Coast terminals for 10 days. Uh, I, I don't even want to contemplate what that would mean in the current environment. And then there was also a failure to reach an agreement. So towards the end of 2014 into early 2015, there was not a strike or a shutdown as such. It was more the let's work slow kind of thing. So in the early parts of 2015, there was a queue of 40 vessels outside Los Angeles, Long Beach, which was seen as a disaster at the time. Again, putting things into perspective, now the queue is more than 100 vessels. Furthermore, back then, when we then had an agreement, it took six months for everything to work normally again. So that also puts the current debacle into context. Now, fast forward to, to this time around. It's very clear that there is zero buffer capacity. You can then, you have your graph here, can we divert to Canada or Mexico or the US East Coast? Well, that will just move the congestion problems up a notch in those areas. That is not a solution. There is no buffer capacity. In terms of how this will play out, I'm going to go out on, my, on a limb here and make my own forecast of it. I expect that there will actually be an agreement. I do not expect a baseline where there will be a strike for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's going to be immense pressure on the union not to make a horrible situation even worse. Then I'm not really, and the terminals might be offended, but I don't see the terminals as a player here. At the end of the day, it's the carriers that's going to play the bill, pay the bill. The carriers have learned over the last 18 months. It doesn't matter whether you charge a customer $50 or $100 more. They're paying five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 more. So they can certainly live with a deal that becomes a lot more expensive. The key bone of contention here is going to be over automation, which the union will fight tooth and nail. And what we're likely going to end up with is a deal where there will be much higher salaries for the port workers. There will be more of an open door towards automation as long as it doesn't cost a single job. Up until then, which means from now until the end of June, this will be a circus. Both parties will make it sound like this is a complete breakdown. This is going to be horrible. It's going to be the end of the world. That will all be negotiation, nothing else. But my baseline expectation will be, yes, there will be a deal. And yes, it will be a more expensive deal. And that will be passed on to the shippers. Yeah. I, I can only echo everything, as Lars has said. I think politically, the, the optics of, of the union completely paralyzing the U.S. West Coast. Now that even the cashier at the local supermarket is knowledgeable about supply chain issues when he explains to you that why something is not in stock, this is not this is inconceivable to me. The political pressure on them is going to be enormous. Uh, uh, but I also agree there will be the usual shell game uh, you know, guess where the ball is now among these three cups and, and lots of posturing and and, uh, and and stuff for the next three to six months for sure. But there will be a deal. It will cost money. I'm not so sure that the unions, if I had to disagree with anything last said, are going to just bend over an automation without some ironclad guarantees. Mm. Uh, they did actually bend over on, on automation, for example, of an AP Muller terminal uh, last time, only to turn around after they had gotten their salary increase and say, well, we didn't really mean that. 
and that took years to resolve. Yeah, They're very good at playing that game. And then they also know that the East Coast Union's contract, I forget when that's coming up, but it can't be more than a few years from now or a year uh, before the ILU is is uh, is uh, up for renegotiation on the East Coast. And those two unions have become much more uh, chummy with each other than they used to be. Um, uh, so so that, that will be more fun to watch. But the West Coast, I think, is it's a shell game and it will resolve itself without too many issues this time. That's interesting. Nobody knows, but very, very interesting insight. I'm curious to learn from, from the audience here uh, how you all see this, if this is something you have, uh, you have started to think about. So let's do a quick, uh, let's do a quick poll. Um, what mitigation strategies have you implemented uh, to come in front of a potential strike situation if If, if anything, um, have you planned for alternative routings? Uh, are you looking into a plan or haven't you thought about this uh, whatsoever? Would love to, to get some, uh, some insight from, uh, from the participants here to see what we can, uh, what we can learn. Let's do another, another 10, 10 seconds. <clears throat> see what the insight is. All right, let's take a look at the results. Okay, it's still still moving a little bit, but um, very interesting. Glass beyond, is this a surprise? I, I, I'm not surprised at all. I, if, if anything, I would have thought the last one should have had an even higher percentage because the, mm. the, the sad state of affairs is, of course, uh, every shipper out there is fighting from day to day. I mean, you're standing in the middle of a fire that's very limited bandwidth to think more than a week ahead, given the current problems. that That's the real issue. Yeah. Uh, I, I find it interesting, plan for alternative routings. I'd be interested what those routings are. I mean, the obvious answer is East Coast, right? But uh, there's not going to be a viable alternative uh, because everybody's going to go that way and the carriers are going to urge their customers to go that route. So that might work for two weeks. Yeah, I agree. The uh, challenge is at scale here, right? There are definitely, you know, alternate routing, <coughs> East Coast, Gulf, yeah. Canada, Mexico. But uh, the challenge, as we saw earlier in the presentation, is that uh, 55% uh, of, of total Trans-Pacific volume goes into the West Coast. So you can say the real alternative, that would be fine. I'm going to move my goods earlier than I planned for. But then we're back in the discussion we had before that already for that now, there's insufficient capacity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a good the only one. real answer here, given the lack of alternative routings, is more inventory. Except you can't do that either because you can't get space for it. It's a really, a... yeah. I've never seen this before. I don't think anybody has, not in our lifetimes anyway. Um, of course, you should have a plan. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a plan because it's all hopeless. I'm just saying you should have a a very stratified plan if you're playing everything on Vancouver being your knight in shining armor, then you're not casting the net wide enough. You need to look at Mexico. You need to look at uh, detention and transit. You need to maybe look at Panama, Manzanillo as staging ports, Caribbean, Kingston, places like that, depending on your size, right? Because you need to get it as close to the U.S. as possible. Yeah. Uh, but not necessarily into the U.S., then you have a fighting chance. Yeah. Uh, what's I mean, interesting to me also is, is, is air freight is, is coming, really coming into vogue, right? Uh, that's for high-value cargo. I'd start planning for that. Yeah. I think what we're saying is that don't put your eggs in, in one basket. Uh, look at spreading them because uh, um, it's, it's all about mitigating uh, the, the, the risks here, right? Okay, we have uh, five minutes left. I um, want to make sure that we cover uh, some critically important parts around um, around the outlook uh, and, and further recommendations. So let's uh, let's do this one rather quick here. Um, we're seeing the order book in terms of vessel deliveries uh, spiking uh, quite a bit in 23 and, and four. Uh, more than the double amount of vessel deliveries are hitting the water. Um, And, 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 and that is also translating into more vessel space than expected demand uh, in the middle of 23 and onwards. Um, 
Bjorn, anything else to uh, to add here, real quick, before we we move into recommendations? And, I think uh, people need to be very very careful that they don't seize on this as their as their you know magic bullet or what it, that, that what they wish for. Uh, it may or may not happen. I hear way too many people, and I know you got stats on it. On it's way too many people saying, "Ah, oh, it'll all end in 2023 because there'll be all these new ships coming out." First of all, that's not true. Some ships are going to be delivered towards the fourth quarter of 2023, perhaps, depending on whether there are delay clauses in the contracts with the yards. For example, if if raw material prices, as in steel, goes through the roof. Carriers have been known to delay them. They can also tactically delay them if if uh, if it, they see it to their advantage. Uh, and I mean, on an Asia Europe uh, string that operates normally, you need ten vessels these days. Probably more like twelve. It's not like somebody's all of a sudden going to say, "Oh, here is the shipping line. Uh, here are twelve vessels for your new Europe string." They're going to come out in drips uh, throughout. 23, 24, and in some cases, 25. So this this panacea that people think new vessels are going to be, it's not. It's not. Uh, and there are all kinds of other things they can do. Scrapping. Uh, the old Panamax vessels that are going to fall flat on their face over IMO 23 are going to be the first ones uh, to be driven up on the beaches. Uh, and there are other things like they've actually, carriers have reduced the years over which they depreciate ships, which would give them a way of also taking capacity out. They will not be able to play a zero sum game, but they will they will certainly be able to ensure that there's not just capacity being pumped into the market. They yeah. can take some of it out in the other end as well. Yeah. That makes sense. Um thank thanks for those uh this is Bjorn super super insightful. Let's take a look at then the the sort of overall highlights in terms of, let's say, a three-year forecast. Uh, this is sort of the flex port view. I'm not going to repeat uh, all the all, all the bullets that are already listed here. As said, you are more than welcome to download the, the, the deck. Uh, I'd much rather hear from the two of you uh, how you see this. Do you generally sort of agree with the highlights here? Any uh, any tweaks? Uh, let's, uh, let's start with you, Lars. I mean, o- overall, to make it very short, in the happy scenario with no additional shocks to the system, we could hope for a reversal to normal operations towards the end of 2022. We could hope for a normalization of rates halfway through 2023. By the way, that normalization will be at a level substantially higher than anything in the past, and that will remain there going forward. But the one thing I will also add is don't plan for the happy scenario. There are two extremely large risks right now. Mm. One yeah. is shutdowns in China due to COVID. You could have Shanghai close the day tomorrow. That's a toss-up. So that is very much on the card. The second one would be the high risk of cyber attacks happening on critical infrastructure as a consequence of the Russia-Ukraine. Keep in mind, when mm. Musk was taken down, that was an attack on the Ukraine by Russia. Nobody even targeted Musk. They were purely collateral damage. Back then, the market could handle the world's largest carrier being out of action for a week because there was buffer capacity. Right now, there is zero buffer capacity anywhere. Bring down a line or bring down one or two major ports, and the mess we have now will look like nothing compared to what could happen. As an individual shipper, there's not a lot you can do right now except ask yourself, is there any critical data where I am always dependent on looking that data up from one of my suppliers? You might want to make sure you have an offline version available of that as well. Right now, the cloud is not necessarily your friend. You need a, a memory stick somewhere <laughs> with the stuff on that it really needs, uh, that is really critical. Uh, and then I would just, I would just say in closing from my side, this this when will we return to normal hey i detest the phrase new normal uh but when will we when when people tell me uh, ask me when will we return to normal they tend to mean when will we go back to 2700 dollars to the west coast and 1900 to europe and the answer is not probably until i've retired uh which is hopefully a few years from now i, I just don't see it happening so that mindset needs to die you well, also, I mean, maybe just as a last comment from me, also in terms of mindset, 
the very largest importers, they are poised to make record profits in 2021, yep. despite the operational problems, despite the high prices. And that also clearly shows us that if you are really hurting and struggling in the current environment, the harsh message here is you have to look at your business model. How can you make it work under these conditions rather yeah. than hope for the market to come back? Yeah. That's some real good insight. And, and, and I like the, the recommendation uh, to everyone right there in terms of protecting uh, your, your data. Please uh, make sure you have a backup in these uh, uncertain times. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll add that to the list here. Uh, of, of already outlined recommendations. Um, again, feel free to um, follow up with any any follow up questions. We would love to engage more. Um, we try to present a lot today, but as always, the devil is in the details. So please uh, follow up with any additional questions. Uh, I hope you all found uh, the insight uh, valuable. Uh, there was quite a bit of doom and gloom, but as said early on, we'd rather set uh, expectations uh, as opposed to disappointing uh, everyone down the line. Um, there are glimpses of sunlight. Um, there are also opportunities for risk mitigating. So um, we hope, again, you found all the insight valuable. Thanks to you, Lars. Thanks to you, Bjorn. Very uh, insightful. Thank you. Thank you for having us.